everyone. This is Sima Lieberman, the inclusionist with Everyday Conversations on Race, where we bring people together to have conversations about race. If you have ever wanted to have a conversation about race, but you were afraid to do so because you were afraid of either saying the wrong thing or afraid of being ignored or trivialized, then this podcast is for you. If you would, if you like this show, please download more episodes at www.raceconvo.com. That's raceconvo, like conversation.com. And if you really, really like the show, then please share the show or this episode with at least one or two other people. I am so excited about my two guests today who I've known for a while, who I consider uh, pioneers. You know, we all inspire each other. And there are two people who inspire me, Howard Ross, who I've known for a few years, who is one of the, uh, I, I mean, he's an expert in a lot of fields, but he's done some great work on, on bias, that he's one of the original bias people. And then <laughs> Le Manoir, who has been my friend for, I don't know, 20, 23 years. And he's an amazing facilitator. He's an amazing speaker. I'm going to let them share a little bit about themselves. So Howard, would you like to share a couple of sentences about you that I didn't cover? I know we didn't cover that much. Um, well, it's, it, it's, hi, Sim, it's nice to be with you and really nice to be with Munwa again. We haven't seen each other in a while. Yes, um, right. yeah. yeah, so, um, you know, it's hard. It, it's not easy to cover 70 years briefly, but um, I've been doing this work professionally for about 35 years, I guess, being paid for doing work in diversity inclusion for about 35 years and worked in 47 of the 50 states and probably 40 plus other countries. Um, and uh, just glad to be with you. And Munwa. Well, I, I was just thinking when I was listening to your introduction that you were the, you know, this is called the inclusionist. Well, I would probably say I'm, I'm an exclusionist. In other words, <laughs> what I meant by that is, is that I remember a reporter wanted me to ask, talk about inclusion and I said, no. And, uh, and then, then he got upset. And then I said, well, why don't you ask me why? And, I, and he said, well, why then? And I said, well, because I refuse to talk about inclusion without talking about exclusion. And I think that inclusion is far easier to talk about uh, because it skips over how we're still very much divided and people are, are constantly on the outside even today. So, so my, my, my work is, you know, I, I've been a teacher for about 25 years, special ed, which I really love in San Francisco. And then I, um, for the next 33 years, I'm, you know, not really something I expected. I became a filmmaker, author and uh, doing diversity work. And one of my films was The Color of Fear, which kind of took off and in many ways pulled me out of the classroom into a world and a life I didn't expect. And along the way, I got to meet Howard and I got to meet uh, Sima. So that was, that was a great plus. And so I'm really very, very uh, uh, thankful to be here today and, and uh, sandwiched between these two. So it's really two important people in my life. So. Yeah, and there's, there's so much to talk about. I, I, want, I want to start out, though, talking about, and I know, Howard, you said it's, it's going to be yesterday's news, and it is going to be yesterday's news, hopefully, but I think that it's important for people to know going forward so we could look at why the conversation is still important. And that was the executive order that was uh, put out by Trump on September 22nd, banning, essentially banning uh, diversity and inclusion training, discussions about diversity and inclusion. So Howard, you were directly involved. We were, Mama and I were affected by it, but Howard, you were directly involved in it. So could you just share the story with people? Sure. Well, yeah, <laughs> it's, it's one of those things that, you know, I, I just should not have had to deal with, but nonetheless, it comes up. Yeah, on um, in June, um, uh, Dr. Janetta Cole, who actually her picture is right over my shoulder here, a longtime dear friend and colleague and mentor of mine, and, and she and I often work together. And uh, we were asked by the Department of Treasury to, um, to do essentially a town hall. Uh, they were concerned after the murder of George Floyd, um, a lot of Americans are very upset and, um, and a lot of white folks in the organization also upset and not knowing how to talk about it with each other. And so they asked if we could do, you know, a session. We were interviewed with a guy named Rodney Hood, who was actually a, a, a Trump appointed leader at the, at the Treasury Department, um, African-American guy. And we had a great conversation. It was, you know, um, very positively responded. They had 9,000 people who voluntarily called in. It was a, it was a completely open Thing. nobody was forced to come and we put together a handout 
um, to go along with it, which was a guide for having conversations about these difficult topics in, in trying times. And it was just a collection of various books that were available, resources that were out there, some guidelines to use and having conversations, creating safe space for people, that sort of thing. So nothing particularly controversial in the work that we all have been doing from, for all these many years. Um, and then what happened was about uh, three weeks later, I got a call one morning from a CNN reporter uh, who has interviewed me many times for stories over the years and um, who said, hey, I don't know if you know it, but there are people going after you on Twitter. And I closed down my Twitter account about a year ago because it just got so toxic. It, you know, it was taking up, it was a great energy for me. And anyway, it turns out that this guy on the, on the West Coast um, named Rufo, who's you know, part of an extreme right wing think tank, um, had gotten taken six sentences from the 30 page document and 37 seconds from the 90 minute conversation we had and created this story somehow that white people were being forced to come in and, and admit their guilt. And, um, and uh, we were teaching critical race theory, which, you know, wouldn't have been a bad thing if that's what we were doing. It just happened not to be what we were doing. I mean, critical race theory is, of course, a very complex and, and deeply researched field in academia. And, and it's been around for 40 years, probably. So it's not like there would have been anything wrong with that anyway, but it just it didn't happen to be what we were doing. Anyway, so he um, he started on Twitter, started on the dark internet, then on Twitter. Then he wrote an op-ed for the New York Post decrying the obscene diversity scam inside the Trump government. You know, dredged up 20 years of, um, of projects that my ex-company Cook Ross had done and, and then exaggerated that number and accused me of, you know, basically... You know, it sounded almost like I had met somebody at the waterfront with a suitcase full of money to do this work clandestinely when it was, of course, all very open and public. And as I said, completely voluntary. In any case, Keith and Laura Ingram's show, um, the hate started at that point, surprising in matter of it, anti-Semitic. Um, that faded away after a while. And, and, and then throughout August, it was pretty quiet. And then at the end of August, he reappeared on Tucker Carlson's show. And that was apparently the show that the President Trump saw. And then a few days later came out with the initial um, part of the executive order. But fortunately, as, as we said, um, uh, by January 21st, I think that executive, that executive order will, will disappear and we'll get back to some sense of uh, sanity about all this. So when the executive order disappears, but does that mean that money is is released right away that then, then there's no, there won't be any holds or anything stopping this, stopping our work there? Well, I think it's, it's hard to tell. I mean, I think that there won't be any legal restriction anymore. And, and okay. you know, I mean, there was already um, some pushback happening from some of the organizations. I mean, the government organizations, you know, obviously the, the president determines things and the government can make that determination. But the, as you know, the executive order was beyond that, a, a huge overreach. He also, stipulated to any company that was that that had any kind of contract with the government could not do training within their own organizations and a number of CEOs who I talked to were furious about that because they said regardless of the topic it's not the president's job to tell us what we could train our own people in um, but I think I, I suspect what's going to happen is you're going to see in the Biden government uh, and he's made this really clear. He has a real commitment to diversity inclusion work. And, and I suspect that what you're going to see is, is more rather than less money that are fed there. And most of the people I've talked to um, who have been dealing with, with the implications of this since it happened back in September have been saying that, that they've been told that things have been postponed as opposed to being canceled anyway. And so most of those things will just probably get put right back into the schedule beginning at the end of January, we hope. Now, obviously, Certain agencies may have people who are resistant to the work, and that's a bigger conversation for us to have. But I think, as far as the executive order is concerned, um, it's it. Hopefully, it will just it will disappear like a lot of the other executive orders that that, that President Biden will uh, sign out of existence. We hope so. And Manoir, now I was on a project with you, um, so could you share about how we were affected by that order? Well, I had no idea that Howard was was responsible for that until today. I know. Uh, <laughs> I guess it's going to be a, a guilt by association after today. There yeah. you go. Exactly. <laughs> Worked thirty five years. Yes. Well, you know, um, I mean, I, I just recently had another proposal, and and they had a sent had to go through all of my materials to see if I said the word white privilege. Um. So all I simply said was, well, if I put Trump on it, would that, would that be counting too? But um, uh, 
yeah, we were deeply affected by it too, and and um, but by that, and and I think that it's it's very sad. I think that one of the one of the observations I made, uh, Howard and Sima, was that I was waiting for members of the Democratic Party, particularly white senators, and and Congress folks, to have said something. And, well, and and once again, it was kind of like this this silence that I. And I heard it from a lot of black folks. I heard it from the NAACP. But I really, you know, I think it was one more time uh, where you wonder, well, where is everybody? You know, it's kind of like, and, and maybe when everything gets tough, diversity trainings are the last, are the first things to go. Uh, but, uh, but, I, but, uh, but that was what I was looking for because then it would have told me something about the commitment. Uh, but of course, I'm sure everybody was afraid of Trump too. But, but I was wondering where my democratic, uh, supporters were and uh, when it gets really tough like this. I was wondering where university presidents were. I was wondering where the presidents and CEOs of major corporations were who are always touting diversity trainings and where were their voices too. So it's, it's almost like, you know, is it only gonna be the folks who have their contracts, uh, you know, deleted or, or wiped out are the ones that do the speaking versus the people who they're doing it for. You would want them to be the ones speaking out if they in fact really felt how important it was. Well, also we got the letter and the letter that they sent us, we called it, said that they were that they were postponing or indefinite because it was a propaganda, unpatriotic, uh, what they say, divisive. And then when I read it, they were talking about how because it made white people feel bad because it made, and it made the, and made the country look bad. And God forbid we should ever make white people feel bad, you know. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Or, or makes it, I mean, and what, what we're saying is that we see potential in our country and we want to make it live up to its potential. This is why we do what we do. So, right. my, my, so, so my question to both of you is, why is this still important? So why is it really important? I mean, I, I never thought I was going to have to keep on justifying it, but I think we, we need to just talk about why is the conversation on diversity? Why is the conversation on a race? Why is it so important still? And either so one why of you, you could, want to go first? Could go. Oh, um, well, I think that, that you know, how, how I wrote us a little bit note, and I, I think that uh, uh, about this resistance to it is, is I think it was happening, the resistance and fear long before Trump, you know, signed it off and said we couldn't do it anymore. I, I think that uh, it's important. I think because we have become so pol polarized, and uh, and I and, and it's and it's not that it's just becoming verbally uh, polarizing, but that people are being threatened, people are being shot, people's lives are being lost. Um, we we are at, at this place, you know, with all the police violence towards blacks. Uh, you know, it's always been going on, you know, and, and it's only because perhaps, as my son said, the pandemic forced us to look at it. And, and also all of the incredible protests, which I think it was really, really important to highlight it all. I don't think it's like it's gotten worse. I think it, it became more public. In other words, I think it's always been here. I think that we've always been under the illusion that the Civil War, once the, the North won, that it was over with. But the truth of it really be told is that it just went underground. And I also think that I, I've been telling folks when I remember when, when uh, people of color, you know, because of affirmative action and all different underrepresented groups came to workplaces and you started, people started talking about what was, why it was so important to have affirmative action and things like this to equal the playing field. But I think that all you had to do was look around the room <laughs> and you could see the faces of people who just did were not happy. And, and I think that, that what we didn't do was to go, so Michael, what's coming up for you? I noticed that you're really quiet. I noticed you're looking out the window. I noticed you're whispering to your other friends, what's coming up for you? When, you? when you think about affirmative action as a white male, what do you think? And I think that that conversation is still sitting here. Uh, I, I remember recently I, I wrote a paper to counter the white, uh, uh, feelings that we should have all lives matter instead of black lives matter. And, and what I said was, you're not quite understanding what it's the black lives matter word means. But I said, perhaps we ought to put it this way. Uh, do white male lives matter more than black lives? Do white male lives matter more than women? 
uh, do white male heterosexual lives matter more than gays? Do white heterosexual wealthy lives matter more than the poor? And I think that that question, that inequity is important to look at. And, 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 in, and in truth, I would like to say that it isn't just that blacks are experiencing inequity, but oftentimes the discussion becomes only black and white. And so what ends up is for people of color, we have to fight with blacks and each other to try and get some footage or some conversation about also the plight of our people. You know, I mean, I, mean, I think it was just more recently only two or three months ago when I read how many American Indian First Nation women were missing into the thousands. But I didn't see that in any of our newspapers. And, and, and then also, you know, when, when the COVID hits and they have all these funds that are supposed to go to them and they didn't get them, I didn't see people really protesting about that. And so there's in a way that we've kind of like had our little groups. And so within all of this movement and anguish, is also our inter you know, interculturally that we go on with each other that we haven't really been able to reckon with. And so I think that this conversation is very much here. And I also think that, that it does, I, was, I wrote a paper for my latest newsletter, it's called How History Repeats Itself. And I, and I started to say, to point out all the common characteristics of people who are authoritarian. And I, I brought out nine points and every single one of them is exactly what's happening today in the Trump administration that is familiar to what's going on in the Philippines, what's happening in, in parts you know, where, where neo-Nazis are, what would happen in the McCarthy era. And so, so all of that, the, the commonality, and, and, and so one of those is, is that people who have alternative thoughts, who think about you know, uh, uh, healthcare for everyone and helping the poor and things like this, we are called terrorists. We are called socialists, communists, and people who are anti-American and unpatriotic. And by the way, that, those are the exact words that are all over the country that people use. In other words, we're outsiders. And one of the first things is to have people become suspicious of the media. And then hence, when you think about it, uh, when the president only gets his news from Fox News, then of course he starts to hear you know, the, the fringe and far right. But I think that I, it's important to say it's no longer really just the far right. It's really the neo-Nazis, the white supremacists, the KKK. And I think that they're, they're much more pervasive in this country than we know. So I think that it's really important now because I, you know, I, someone said we have more gun shops than we have schools. And I think that the access to violence to settle our differences is we are so dangerously at that point. And I think that, that the uh, uh, far right is all, all the, you know, ready to pick up their, their guns to fight for America again, which is, you know, when, when the president says, make America great again, he, what he means is make it white again, the way yeah. we all looked all the same and controlled everything. And so, uh, you know, I think that's why I'm so appreciative of your work, Howard, because it's so important that, that, we, that we keep understanding that it's happening today and, and it's a long history that still hasn't been dealt with. Yeah, thank thanks, you. thanks, well, thanks Munwa. Yeah, yeah um, uh, well, I, I, I could pick up on everything um, Munwa said. I, I, I don't up. disagree with anything. I would say, uh, I'd say at, at the fundamental, you know, the, the, the last point you made, Munwa, is I think the fundamental core one, which is that it's still happening. And I think that that's, that, that's at the fundamental level. One of the real challenges is that people don't accept the reality that black women still die three times more often than white women, that black and white that black men and women live shorter lives, um, that virtually in every major disease, there are disparities that, that have black and brown people get sicker than, um, exactly. than white people. Um, you know, we saw that with COVID, for example, that the percentage of high school students who graduate, the percentage of college students who graduate, the black unemployment rate is higher, that home ownership is higher, that only four of the 500 uh, Fortune 500 CEOs are black. You know, I could go on and on with these statistics. This is not yesterday's news. This is today's news. And so why do we do this work, Sim? Again, getting back to your question, we do this work because we want to fulfill the American dream. The American dream is that all people are created equal and have un unalienable rights. Now, we know that even in that document, even in the Constitution, um, we didn't say all people, we said all men. Um, so we were already exclusive in that. But I do think it's important for folks in, in the context of what Munoz is talking about relative to this concept of all lives matter to realize what the word all has meant in American history. That our constitution said 
all men are created equal, but it didn't mean women and it didn't mean people of color. It meant all white men. That at the end of our um, Pledge of Allegiance, we say liberty and justice for all, but for most of American history, it legally did not mean all, let alone in an actual fact. Um, and, so, and so what we're trying to accomplish is we're trying to change that, um, the, the reality into our aspirational goal, which is that all people be created equal, that all people have that right. Now, the challenge with that is after 400 years on this continent and you know, 200 and whatever, 50 years of our American experiment, that, um, that we know um, that that's been a very unequal situation. We know that white people from the start and white men specifically have benefited dramatically. And when you try to write that, when you've got a system that has been like this for 400 years and you try to write it, it feels like something's being taken away from the people who had that unearned advantage. And so you've got you know, people who look like me, um, who've grown up in this world and have, have their whole lives been treated like they are better than because of what Brian Stevenson calls this narrative of racial difference that we have in our country. And all of a sudden you say, wait a second, you're not gonna get an advantage anymore. It feels like something's been taken away, even though we would, we would all agree nothing's been taken away. Actually something was being taken away that's now being put back in. It feels at the moment like that's what's happening. And then we have to also acknowledge that some of the work that's been done hasn't always been particularly efficacious. It's, it, it often has demonized people and added to the us versus them kind of tension, um, as opposed to asking the kind of questions that Munoz was inviting, which is, you know, to invite people to really develop an awareness. What's, you know, I think one of the things, Munoz, that you and I share is a passion for mindfulness work as well. And, um, you know, when you do work around mindfulness, you begin to see that the important questions are the inward questions, not the outward questions. It's, it's actually in inviting people to what is it to be a white man in this culture? And, um, you know, what does it feel like? And, and I could say for myself, even being Jewish, because um, being Jewish is really funny in this culture, you're kind of one foot on the station and one foot on the train, you're kind of in and out at the same time. Um, but that, that, you know, all of the things that I've had to unlearn over the course of my, his, of my personal history, all of the things that I was taught to do very normally, not like taught to be mean, just taught to be normal, it quotes, um, and then you realize at some point that that normalcy actually excludes other people. It dominates other people. It, it, it gives you unearned advantages that other people don't get. And so over time, um, we have to understand that in order to, to try to have ourselves be what we would hope that we are. Thank you. I, you know, I, one thing that, that comes to mind as, as I'm listening to both of you talk is that I think one thing that the three of us have in common, I mean, we have a lot in common, but one thing is that and this might sound strange, is that we know how to talk to white people. We know how to talk to, and we care about talking to white people, not the ones that like say, live like in Berkeley or, or somewhere like that. But we know how to talk to white people that, that aren't like, don't think that think that, you know, don't even know what woke means. And I, and, and I think that we all have some kind of empathy. You know, I was raised like a, in a, what well, was a Jewish, it was Jewish, it was like very working class. And so I've always had that relationship with working class people, even though that, you know, that, that aren't Jewish, that maybe tend to not be as say like liberal. But what, because, and, and I see a lot of people, you know, who, especially after the election, I see a lot of white people that want to be better than the other white people that aren't in agreement with them. and. I think that we have, because of what we do, we have responsibility, I think that we could help make change. So I would like to, to hear both of you talk about how you do that. Like how, how do you, because I know you both very good at talking to, to, to white people. Well, uh, if you don't mind if I go first here. It's, 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 no, it's, please, correct. You go right ahead. It's your stream of thought. But I was just thinking that when you shared, Sima, that we've learned how to talk to white people. Uh, I think that it's different for each for us in the screen because uh, uh, you don't have to worry as much how white people will respond to you because you are white. Exactly, exactly. Uh, and so I've had to learn how to blend in and, and study white people. And I think, I, I think my father spent a good part of our youth training us and informing us about how not to get white men angry because he, we could lose our jobs, we could lose our rent, we could get arrested, uh, we could get fired, all these kind of things. 
I remember Robert Bly, a very famous poet um, out of Minnesota, and he was just talking about how his father um, groomed him to go out into the world when he was around 12 about the, you know, what the world would look like. And I said, uh, no, I said, that, that was, I got up and I said, no, that was not my experience. That was yours. I said, my experience was how to be careful for the white man. And I was very clear, my father was very clear what I could not do so that I would not aspire uh, to a places where my life would be in danger or I would not be welcomed. And, uh, and, I, and I think that that, that, that distinction is, is very important. That the, the, the problem for me as a therapist and psychologically is that for the longest time in my life is that I was always fighting the stereotypes about being an Asian man. And so, and, and so you can imagine what happens is you kind of leave this, this multiple personality because you're always worrying about how not to look Asian, to look at all the stereotypes. So you can't really fully relax to be yourself. So I want you to think about that. I mean, as usual, as a woman, you have to worry about that. But maybe if, if, if Howard doesn't decide to tell people he's a Jew, then he won't have to worry about them. He'll just be one of the guys. I remember a, a person in the film, uh, If These Halls Could Talk, the one I did, uh, on young people and, and, and the young, uh, Italian uh, woman says, uh, I can tell you unequivocally that I never have to worry when I go from room to room to adjust myself to the culture of the room. It'll look like the one I'm used to. Mm -hmm. I cannot imagine rooms where I go anywhere in this country where I'm not constantly having to adapt to the room. And, and uh, I, I remember when, when I was wearing my kimono and Tibetan shirts, how oftentimes somebody would say, well, aren't you afraid that you won't look professional enough? And, uh, uh, and what I said is, isn't it funny? You love to brag to the world that we're multicultural, but in fact, I believe we're monocultural and we're monolingual. And I said, and so the, the good ex you know, example of that is that how many people know five or six words from any first nation, nation tribe in the United States? And yet they were the very first people. We didn't even think about having to learn their language. So hence the template, isn't it funny that we're, we demand, white Americans demand that people of color speak English when we come here. But then when, when, when white Americans go to Japan or France or Germany, they demand that that country speak English. Otherwise it's considered uncivilized you know, or uneducated. And so, so that that world to me is, is so very different. And, uh, and I think it's still that way in my lifetime uh, Howard and Sima, I will never see a Chinese man become the president of the United States. I will never see a Muslim, maybe not even a first America, first people uh, being one. Uh, we might see Mexican, but I think that somebody went and we did have one black president. And by the way, of course, we had five other black ones who didn't tell anybody who they really were because of that, you know, but, but I think that 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 saddens me. And, and, and so I don't ever feel, as you said, Howard, that uh, I'm an American or even that it included me. You know, you were very right. You know, I should have been suspicious when they called it the White House. And uh, I remember a Supreme Court justice that met Ruth Ginsburg. And he said, when she was fighting for women's rights and he says to her, one of the Supreme Court justices, you do know the constitution does not mention women. And Ruth Ginsburg looked at him and said, and neither does it mention the word freedom, but it doesn't mean that we can't fight for it just because it's excluded. Look, I think it's really important. It, you know, it, it, it's, 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 you're so on point, Manuai. You know, I, I've said for years to people, I said people who three, speak three languages, we call trilingual. People who speak two languages, we call bilingual. People who speak one language, we call American. <laughs> it's, it's exactly. <laughs> you know? It's so true. Um, you know, but I think it's, but I, I think that there's, there's at the heart of this too, that there's, there's, when you talk about reaching white people about it, I think, you know, one of the churches is that, that there's not, there's not been a lot of, um, uh, openness about us really looking at this and the challenge that it is for everybody to make this adaptation to a system that has been designed to produce exactly the result that it's producing. And I think this is one of the places where people misunderstand. Um, a lot of times we look at racism in America, we look at the separation, and for that matter, the other is of sexism and, or sexism and all these things. We look at these things somehow as aberrations. 
Um, but in reality, this is a system that's been perfectly designed to produce exactly the result that it's been producing. And this is what we talk and we mean when we talk about systemic racism. It doesn't mean that everybody in the culture is hateful. It doesn't mean white people are others because we know that racism can, or prejudice anyway, bias and prejudice can go both different directions. I do think it's important for people to understand something different and something becomes systemic as in racism. Very different, for example, Moonwalk and not like me because I'm white and that might be prejudice and biased. And we might say that it's too bad that he doesn't like you, that you don't like white people, but you don't have an entire system behind you to enforce that with yeah. it. And so I, all, I need to, all I need to do to deal with that is say, all right, well, Moonwalk, the hell with you? I'm not gonna spend any time with you then. But to go down the street, but if, if, if a BIPOC person does that same thing, they're likely to run into another person on the street who, who feels exactly the same way within 10 minutes. So, so I do think it's important for us to recognize those differences. And my experience has been in working with, um, with all people. I mean, I think, you know, being white and doing this work, especially being a, a cisgendered straight white male, um, has been an interesting ride over these years. You know, when I started doing the work 35 years ago, there were like a handful of us, you know, straight yeah. white men who were doing this work around the country. And the, mo and the basic attitude was, what the hell are you doing up there? You know, <laughs> why are you doing this work? Then we went through a period over time where all of a sudden it was a good thing for white people to be doing this work because you could reach the white people. Now we're back swinging back. People say, no, white people shouldn't do this work. You know, we've gone back and forth the best. Um, you know, and it, it's not always a picnic, you know, they're, they're um, for, for some white people, there's a special kind of hate that they have for people who do this work, who are white, you know, that's, when, when I was doing civil rights work, when I was a kid, you know, it was the, you were called an end lover. Um, nowadays, a race trader, you know, a race, race trader, tra a race trader, all this kind of stuff. But I think ultimately, people want to be dealt with as human beings. And I think one of the mistakes that we've often made in, with folks is that we assume because people benefit from the system, that they are actively a part of that system, or they, uh, they actively achieve chosen to play that role in the system and they actively are even conscious about the role they're playing in the system whereas we all know as practitioners that one of the real um the real impacts of privilege is that you don't have to know that you have it so so when Munoz was talking about not having to go into a room and worry where you fit for example you know one example that i like to give is i've got four sons the youngest of whom is 26 and they all learned to drive and I taught them all to drive and never did I think to have a conversation with them about how to keep their sense safe if they were stopped by a police officer. And yet every African-American parent I know, every friend I have who's had a child that age has had that driving while black conversation. Every one of those parents would have their children go out in that car at the beginning of an evening, worry about what's gonna happen before they come home. And, and it doesn't matter about socioeconomic status. You know, I had a client here in the DC area where I live, who was a very senior executive for a major corporation that, that everybody would know about, earning over $600,000 a year, lived in a very um, high end neighborhood in suburban Washington that was um, predominantly white. And he told me in tears one day in his office that his son was home from Princeton for the summer staying with him for 10 weeks. And in 10 weeks was stopped four times by police officers coming in and out of his own neighborhood, driving his father's car. And, and what he felt, said to me in tears, this powerful, successful, wealthy man said to me, what scared me to death was that my son would lose patience and then something horrible would happen. And, th and think about that. You know, the, the thought in his head was not about the police officer. It was about his son maintaining his son's protectiveness. Now, you know, as somebody with four four children and six grandchildren, four of whom are of mixed race, um, I think that touches, that touches the heart, very heart of people. And, and I think one of the things that, that I found is that when we can get people to put themselves, and, and I, you know, I've worked with white folks, I'm not just talking about, like you said, people who are on the left on this or something. You know, I right. not long ago, after, after the George Floyd incident, did a workshop with, uh, with the senior leaders of an oil company in Texas, 75% of whom had voted for President Trump the last time around. So, so I think that there are ways to reach people, but one of the things you also have to do is to recognize you're not gonna reach everybody. And if you can't reach right. one person, you just keep moving forward. You don't let it set you back. You just, all right, that one didn't work, go to the next one and keep moving forward. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree. I think that we're not gonna reach everybody, uh, but we, we're not gonna reach everybody and that we also have to be aware that there's certain elitism that some people have where they think that, you know, everything that they do is perfect, but they're not perfect in every single area. And that, you know, me, you, the three of us, we all have a lot, we all have a lot to learn too. We can learn from each other. We can learn from other people. But I think that there is a danger when people think that they don't need to talk to anybody. 
I mean, I had somebody, well, I had one of my, one of my favorite people that she wasn't on the show, but she listened to the show. And the day after she listened to the show, she was a white woman. And I knew she was conservative, but I didn't know how conservative she was. So I just want you to know, I listened to your show last night and I'm thinking, hmm, I wonder what she thought. And she said, you know, I'd never really heard a conversation like that with a black person. She said, you know, I voted for Trump. She said, and after this last, after listening to your show, I'm not gonna vote for Trump anymore. And then after George Floyd, she said, well done. And after, she, after, after, after George Floyd, she sent me a note. She said, I'm doing everything that I can. I want to learn how, I want to do what I can to dismantle racism, she said. And she said, as somebody who was raised in a racist, evangelical, Christian family and background, she said, I know that I can reach other people who come from the same background in a way that, you know, that I, that I couldn't. Yeah, well, yeah, look, I mean, one of the things that I found, and I'm, I don't know whether it's true for both of you as well, but one of the things I found is that sometimes it's harder to work with people who see themselves as liberals um, than it is to, to work with people who are conservatives. Because when I work with conservatives about this, people like the woman you're describing, their attitude is often, wow, I had no idea. I, I didn't have a clue about this. Um, you know, I don't know what the hell I'm doing. Please tell me what, you know, how, you know, there, there's, there's usually a genuine understanding. I'm not talking about people who are like when I was describing before who are overt white supremacists or, you know, would be extremists. I'm talking about sort of your average everyday person in corporation. Um, but often in working with liberals, um, we are so attached to our um, ego identity as the good guys, you know, the good ones, um, that the notion of looking at ourselves and looking at our own blind spots feels like an ego threat. And so it's sometimes harder for liberals to do this work with ourselves than it is for people who are conservative because we are, we so want to be good about this. We so want to be right about this. So that's one of the things that really triggered all of the, you know, my 20 years of study into this field of unconscious bias is that, that so many good people who I met who had these profound blind spots and, and it just didn't make a lot of sense to me inside of this context that everything was intentional and conscious because, you know, I'd see people who were, who were literally just wonderful people who would have complete blind spots about race. Um, complete blind spots sometimes about gender or sexual orientation or things like this. And, it's, and, and it clearly wasn't because they were bad people. So what was that was, so it's really that question had me lift up the rock and start to, you know, see what was underneath it um, that eventually led, as I said, to 20 years of research. So. Yeah, because I mean, well, you know, I, I, I'll go ahead and um, I was going to say, ask you what you thought. So I, I'd like to propose perhaps a, a an alternative perspective. I don't necessarily know if it's a blind spot. In fact, I think it's a spot that's filled with lots of images that this country has built up about people who are different that are non-white. Mm -hmm. And so it, and, and we often don't explore what that is. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember, uh, you know, it was a very poignant story. I just wanted to share it quickly because it was, it was pretty right on is, is that I was told when I went to Jasper, Texas to work with the university there. Um, and, um, uh, and, and we had hosted uh, 600 students in high schools at, at the university there. And, and I was told that two skinheads would be uh, uh, stalking me throughout the workshops. And it was pretty easy to see who they were because they were the ones who didn't want to do the workshop. Mm -hmm. But then, so we come down to the last uh, 10 minutes, okay. And, uh, and then one of them gets up and he says this, do you know why there's no black president? You know, this was before Barack Obama. Do you know why? I said, why? And he said, because there's no black person in America that's qualified. And then the whole room was like dead quiet. And this is the last 10 minutes. Mm. And so um, I walked over to him and uh, I said to him, how old are you? And he goes, six, you know, I think it was 15. And I'm 16. And I said, no, you're not 16, you're 15. And he said, when you're 15, you always say you're 16 because he laughs, he goes, okay, I'm 15. And, and so I said to him, I said, so um, uh, where did you learn that from? And he said, uh, why, why, why do you want to know? And, and so you know, remember that, that, that film called Slumdog you know, yeah, Millionaire sure. kind of goes, goes back into his past. And so about a year before that, I had asked all these young people to come to Ukiah, California to interview them for my, my upcoming film. And um, uh, so one of the Latinos from Los Angeles said, uh, do you know the difference between a gang, a gang and a hate group? And I said, hmm, I have no idea. 
and he said, well, when you're uh, uh, in a gang, your parents don't want you to be in a gang. But when you're in a, when they're, when, when, but however, when they're in a hate group, they want you to join them. And so I said, really? So I said to the young man, are your parents a member of a hate group? And he goes, yeah. And I said, which one? He goes, the KKK. So then I looked at him, everybody was like, like, what the hell's going on here? And like all hell's gonna break loose. And what happened was I just looked at him and I said, um, well, you know something? You know, if I was born in your family, I'd have a whole lot of different images of black people than if I were in the North. Mm -hmm. And you know something? I said, you know, I'd probably be thinking exactly the way you're thinking about the same thing you are, that there's no black person in America who could be president. So I said, you guess what? You're almost gonna be 16. So now you get to find out if that's true. So I'd like you to take a good look at all these students out here. How many of you would love to talk to him? <laughs> all these hands went up, maybe 599 hands went up. Yeah. And I said, so would you be willing, you know, after we finish here, because I know you're gonna be having lunch out in the courtyard, would you be willing to sit in a chair there and have one person come up one at a time who wants to talk to you about how they felt about what you said? So you get to find out, is it true that there's no black person in America who could become the president of the United States? And you won't believe what he said. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so it's a, well, and so the, the work that I, was, I would think I was trying to share was that I felt like the reason why we don't have a contrary or a different stereotype or even uh, why I also, you know, why I think the one reason why, why, why people are afraid to have these conversations is because they don't have a model of seeing it actually happen. They see people yelling, screaming, protesting, shooting each other. And I think it wasn't until The Color of Fear, my film, did people actually see one where you had all these people of color with white people actually talking. You actually saw a black man get incredibly passionate and everybody stayed in the room, even though they were scared and maybe even confused and unsure of what to say mm -hmm. and how it turned out. And I think that even since that film, I haven't seen another one where people are actually sitting in a room other than my own, to be honest with you, just really with a, not even having a script, but entirely spontaneous. So I think that that example of a peaceful way of talking is really incredibly important. And I, and I also wanna point out that when I've watched all these protests for Black Lives Matter, I've been watching really carefully. I really don't see whites and people of color talking in those protests. I see them standing next to each other. I see them looking at each other, but I don't necessarily see them talking. I don't even remember a single speaker at any one of these events to have shared to everybody, now I'd like you to turn around and shake the hand of somebody who's different than you and turn around and have a conversation. And I'd like you to share who you would like them to know who you really are and why you're here today. Did you know- uh, I think that- Yeah. I, I'm sorry, I'm not, I didn't mean to interrupt you. So I just wanna say one last thing. So the entire sure, na course. national conversation on race not one single person talked to each other just to a panel. And we call that a national conversation or dialogue on race. And so I don't think we have a model for it. We don't know how to have it. And then oftentimes when we do race dialogues, it's a lecture about white fragility, white privilege, bias reduction. And so we have a, a, lot, of, a lot of PowerPoints on it, but I can guarantee you that most people in that room are not gonna be talking to each other. Most people are not going to be talking about their racism and their fears of each other. They're going to do a fun little exercise and that'll be it. And I think that's why uh, for all these years, I've been doing more intimate ones because I totally agree for, for there to be equality institutionally. But like I learned a long time ago, watching eight years ago when the president of this country had a black man to be president of the United States and I saw how we treated him. So in truth, it doesn't matter if we had CEOs in every single major company in this country that was a person of color. 
if the people there don't want to listen, don't want to cooperate, don't want to learn, don't want to follow what they're doing or be inspired by them, it'll just be the same. So this conversation that I'm talking about is still going to be required. You know, just because you have a person of color or a minority in that position does not mean that you have equality. We've got to be open. Yeah. As the Chinese yeah. say, we do not learn from experience, but rather by our willingness to experience. Well, you know what? Look, I, think what, what, what oh, I, I think what you're saying has been my experience, which is you, you treat people like human beings. You treat them like full human beings and in the, in the full authenticity of that. I, you know, I like to say to people all the time that we, um, when, you, <clears throat> excuse me, when you get to know people for who they are, you treat them like what they are. Uh, you treat them less like what they are, I should say. We get to know each other for as human beings. And, and I think that that's at the heart of it. You know, when you're telling your story um, about this young man, I was reminded of, the, you know, probably the seminal moment that had me turn to really it, with inquiry into this whole question of unconscious bias and these these mind bugs that we have, which, and, and you know, I, I, I certainly accept your amendment in terms of what I was calling blind spots, because all blind spots are, are another, another set of values and beliefs that stop you from seeing what's right in front of your face. Um, but I was in a, a workshop in Monroe, Louisiana, which was where David Duke had his headquarters and he ran for governor of Louisiana. Yeah. And um, this is many years ago now, and I was doing a workshop for a newspaper down there, and we were having uh, the first day we did have some of those conversations between black and white folks, because that's what was happened to be who was in the room um, about what it was like for people. And there's a lot of sharing about their own experience. And there was this one young man in the room. He was a, a blue collar guy. He, he was a pressman, you know, one of the guys who ran the presses, you know, jeans and a flannel shirt and a young white guy and maybe 30 years old. And the second morning, um, an hour before lunch, he, he raises his hand. He says, they have something to say. And you both know as workshop leaders, you're always glad to see that new voice come into the room. You know, so I called on Hi. him. He starts talking and he says, and he says, uh, um, you know, I feel conflicted. And I said, what do you feel conflicted about? And he starts talking. The whole time he's looking at his lap. He says, well, I grew up in such and such. He mentions a rural area outside of the town. And he says, my daddy and my granddaddy were my heroes growing up. Taught me to fish, taught me to hunt. Best men I ever knew. Granddaddy was the pastor of our church. And then he went silent for the longest time, so much so that I remember I was about to say, what's your point? When he looks up with tears in his eyes and he says, they were in the clan. And he said, and I'll never remember the, for, never forget this line. He said, it wasn't much talked about, but it wasn't much hidden either. And he went on to talk about the very thing that Munoz was talking about, which is how he was exposed to that, how he was brought into that system of thinking. And yet he says, and so he says, but now when I'm listening to these people, I know they're good and decent people, so I'm sure they're telling the truth, and I just don't know how to sort that out in my mind. Now, now a lot of times we jump in to answer the question for people there. We're really leaving people in that inquiry and inviting them to do exactly what Minwa did, was talk to other people to explore this, to really in, you know, invite that inquiry on themselves, rather than to wave a finger at them and tell them, you know, though your, your, your parents are. And I was left, in those days, we used to do this work with a two by four. I'm going back 20, 25 years ago. You know, we used to beat on people who looked like this until they saw the error of their ways. And if somebody cried, it was always very cathartic, you know. Yeah. But, um, but I, I left back and I remember sitting on the plane on the way home thinking about it. And, and what happened in that particular case was I, I said, could we talk about this? Just pulled up a chair and we talked for an hour, just the two of us in front of this room. And then we broke for lunch and I look out there and there he is sitting 18 inches from the strongest black male voice in a room and the two of them are just connected and talking. You know? And on the plane on the way home, I remember saying to myself, one thought was exactly the one that you just shared, Mwan, which is, which is, if I had grown up in his narrative, could I really say that I would see the world any differently? And then the second was, we'd always been doing this work, trying to convince people to be better people. But this was obviously a good guy. He'd been trained in a bizarre narrative, but he was a good person, you know? And I said, so if this is not about being a good person, then what is it about? And that was, th those were the kind of questions that led me to start digging into this whole concept of bias to see, you know, where is this motivation really coming from? How are our minds really wrapped around this? And why do we think the things that we think? And in fact, coming to the reality that we're not nearly as rational as human beings that we think as we think we are, that we really shouldn't trust the way we think. Right. Well, I, one, of the, one, of the reasons, well, one of the reasons why I started doing this show was <laughs> for that reason. I knew that a lot of people really didn't get to hear or participate in cross-race conversations. Like that's what the show is a cross-race conversation. It's not like a racial tourist conversation or just like white people talking to white people. But I also see it too. It's, um, it's life and death when you think about it because there's a lot of really good people. And Howard, you know this as, as having lost family in the Holocaust, a lot of nice Germans who allowed 
are people to be killed. A lot of nice white people yep. who allowed night Riders and allow people like George Floyd to be killed, you know? And I think that any difference that we can make is maybe that's one white person that doesn't call the police on one person of color. You know, maybe that's one person, one straight person that intervenes when they see somebody who's, L, who, who's gay getting beaten up. So I think that, you know, we really, we, we have to make a difference. And, and, I, and I like that we think in terms of like individuals and also thinking in terms of systems and that it is so often it's the human, it's the human contact because if you don't have that human contact, if you don't have that meaningful contact, meaningful contact with people who are different, then all you have are your biases. All you have are your stereotypes. I mean, look how easy it was during COVID. I mean, it's COVID, but when so many Asian people were being attacked, I mean, mm -hmm. because nice people who were nice said, oh, so-and-so, you know, is a lawyer and, and their families and they've never done anything like this before. Yeah, okay, but they did it this one time and they could have ended somebody's life. So- Well, yeah, actually the, in, in New York City alone, there were 23 times as many hate crimes this year directed towards Asian Americans as there were just last year. So that, that's, oh, a, yeah. that's a real issue. And I, and I think that, you know, look, I mean, I think that, that there, there are a number of things in, in what you're saying. I, I, I think ultimately um, we've got to be willing to engage. And, and one of the things that I found is that it gets back to uh, what, what I was saying about othering, you know, the otherness of people, um, that, that uh, virtually every human being on the planet has some experience of being othered. Um, now, that's not the same as being systemically othered because of race or something yeah. like that, but everybody has that experience of being inside or an outside of a group. This is what, one of the things that led me to my, my work on belonging, which is really the latest work I've been doing, is understand human belong. And, and what I found is that that's something that we can tap in to get people to develop empathy for what it must be to be othered in a different ways. So if I'm a white man and I've been, and I can think of an experience when I was othered because I wasn't in a fraternity that other people were in, or I wasn't in the same socioeconomic status that other people had had, or, or maybe I was gay and that other people would be straight, whatever it is. I can then say, well, you know, think about what that felt like. And now think what that would feel like if every time you walked into a room, that was the first thing people saw when they saw you. And, and, and what I found is that people can actually, from that place, they can actually begin to develop empathy in a way that they hadn't before when you can tap into their own personal experience. And, that, and you know, look, I mean, there's no right way to do this. There's no one way to do this because different people, different approaches. And I think this is one of the other challenges is we want to we want to simplify things that are complex. You know, the conversation that, you know, that that we might have with one participant in a workshop might be completely different than the conversation we have with another one. And, and I think one of the things being a facilitator and somebody with experience is you pick up those distinctions and you know how to reach people away. Yeah. Well, I'm looking at the time and we're, we're almost out of time. That I happens. am so, <laughs> yeah. so we're going to have to do this again. I, you know, I, I'm so enjoying this conversation. So I'm going to ask you Love some to. questions to end, but Mawa, I think you wanted to, did you want to say something before we close? Before yeah, I asked we, you your we, closing we, questions, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. It was just, a, just, a, it's a, it was just a short one. So that I think that, um, Whenever I have like a, even a whole audience of like two or 3,000 people at a time and I pair everybody up and then I ask them, what was it like? And I, I just want to share that in 33 years, not one single person has ever um, diverted from the same answer. And it's always been this one. You know what? I just really loved pairing up with Jim. You know, he's white, I'm black. And I just got to tell you, I was shocked at how many things we had in common. Right. Right. And, and yeah. so what I, what I started to realize was that uh, at first it sounds like a compliment. What that person is really telling you is I really am amazed at how much who you are is like me. Mm -hmm. And then I started to realize, but that's not all what I just told you. I told you quite a few other things to which we were very definitively different. And so in all those 33 years, I have never had one single person go, you know, Jim and I are different and I just loved it. And I just, I wanted to know more about that. And I, that was another way of thinking. I think I'm going to learn something about that. In 33 years, I've never heard one single person say that. And so, the, and when I think about um, uh, uh, all of the, uh, the, when the police chiefs asked me to come, 
to Minneapolis to help them look at a common uh, denominator for the shooters in our schools. And what was fascinating was that 90, they didn't notice that 99% of them were white males. See, they just saw them as individuals. They also came from white suburban neighborhoods. So then the, hence the question becomes is, how did they become that? And so one common factor they all had was besides being white males, was that they were all bullied for being different. All bullied for being different. And I believe that, that when I said heterosexual, you know, uh, 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 to be uh, non-white, to be all those differences in this country that we have not yet come to look at how beautiful and wonderful it is to have somebody who's different. So when someone says, you know, one of the years we used to go, I don't see color. And, I, and what I meant, what they really meant by that is that because I was different, that, I, that if I don't see you having any difference, then that's the uh, object. But I always wanted to say, but I love being Chinese. I love being different from you. And I am different from you. And I want you to stop saying that deep down we're the same. Yeah. Because what that means right. to me is, is, is being like you, but never who I fully am for you to appreciate because I spent my whole life studying you and appreciating you to make you feel good and safe and, and loved. I hate, let me just say, I hate when people say, oh, deep down we're all the same. I go, no, we're not. We don't like the same things. I mean, why do we have to be? So my, my, so my final, I have several final questions to okay. ask all, both of you. Um, first question. So just give me the answer and then I'll ask this one. How do people get in touch with you? Howard, how do people reach you? And what's the name of, um, of, of give the name of a book you want people to read that you wrote. Oh, that, my, that I write. Okay. Well, um, my my company yeah, is is the, the company name is Udarta U D A R T A. So it's which is the Hindu word for generosity and compassion. Oh, really? Um, like and, yeah, and and so they can reach me mm -hmm. at udarta dot com or at howardjross.com. dot com. And um, you know, in terms of books, probably one of my last two. I mean, either the last one, our search for belonging, and actually a lot of the research that we did on social exclusion for our search of belonging proved exactly the point that Mua just made, which is that social exclusion is is at the core of much of our um, antisocial behavior, uh, violent antisocial behavior. And then the other one, Everyday Bias, which originally came out in 2014, but was just released in the second edition uh, a couple of months ago. Okay. So um, either one of those would probably be the ones to catch me at. Are you on Twitter? Uh, no, I am on Facebook and LinkedIn now. Okay, what's your LinkedIn? <laughs> Uh, or you can, if they you, look up Howard J. Okay. Howard J. Ross, they can find me. Okay, I'm gonna put. I'll put it in because I was just told okay, by my great. social media person that I need to like start putting in everybody's everybody's uh, social media so that oh, okay, great. You know, they can get tagged. Okay, appreciate that. Munwa, how do people tell us the name of a book you want people to buy that you wrote and um, how do people reach? Well, you? If you, well, first, if you want to touch or reach me, just go like this. I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> during COVID. During COVID, no one's touching you. <laughs> That's right. Elbow. Not during COVID. Okay. And uh, this is a book that I really recommend. Um, it comes from this box, which is called What Stands Between Us? A thousand questions that whites and people of color are deathly scared to ask each other. So they wrote it down anonymously. Also in the book is 250 questions that white people wished people of color would ask them after they gave them lots of hints. And 250 yeah. questions that people of color wish white people would ask them. And then- That's effing years later, brilliant. Yes, and then two years later, this book came out, 250 whites and people of color answered those questions. And one of those was Robin DiAngelo, who I didn't know who she was at that time. And um, it's one of the hottest books I have. And um, whites and people of color, for every question that the other group asked the other group, five people would answer it. And the, one of the, the hottest questions in this book to start it off is, white people ask people of color, what do we do to keep you from telling the truth? Oh my God. And it became this incredible dialogue to make sure we don't. And one of those was, is just looking at what we have in common. And that was one of the ones that just stopped the conversation. Or I don't see color or, you know, uh, deep down we're all the same, all these things. So it kept the conversation from happening. Or even as this black man said is, uh, when he started to get angry, they only pointed out the positive things he said and not the negative ones. So that was kind of mm -hmm. a very unconscious way of avoiding 
what he really said. It's like it's and like so, all those yeah. songs in the '60s, Moon Why, you know, black, white, brown, <laughs> right, all yeah. together. Remember oh, all that? You know, yes. it's like yeah, right, right. exactly. Yeah. Except when you and I stand next to each other, people will notice something other than I'm <laughs> tall or than right. you. Okay, so my next, okay, next, <laughs> and then the last next one question. Is, oh, go how ahead. To get, how me. to get a hold of us is how to get a hold of me and my, our company is Stir, S T I R, Fry, uh, Stir Fry, F R Y. Uh, seminars and consulting. Here, I'm here in Berkeley, and uh, our phone number is 510 204 8840, extension 103. And we'd love to talk to you. And you could also look up any of my films or my names, and I'll take you right to the website. And I'm on LinkedIn out. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> we're on LinkedIn and Facebook. Uh, and, and that's overwhelming at times. So, yes. okay, we'll put it in. And you're not on Twitter, I take it. You're not on Twitter. Uh, no, because uh, the president took up all the space. So. Oh, okay. Yeah. I got you. All right. So next question <laughs> is, and I don't know if either of you have an answer to this. Um, what's on your playlist? What are you listening to these days? <laughs> um, you, you're that. talking about music, music or, yeah. or like podcasts and things. Um, oh, okay. Um, well, first, there's only I, one podcast, musical, mine. But my, I mean, musical, what, what? my my musical tastes are very eclectic. I'm a musician, and so I played in bands for 25 oh, years. Give us so, one uh, song. Give so us something. Bruce Bruce Springsteen's "Born to Run," the greatest rock and roll song ever written. Okay. Oh, I, I love that one too. Yeah, I love. That okay. One too. And what about you, Benoit? Oh, I like Adele's "Hello." Okay. It, it reminds me all of the loves I uh, went through in my life. <laughs> <laughs> and, That's and, another podcast. And, and I, so, <laughs> I've known them well a long That's time. That's a whole other podcast. So, okay. I'm going to say, I've said this before, but now it just had a resurgence. State of the Union, Public Enemy, the newest one. I mean, you got, you know, if you don't mind a little bit of curse words, I, you know, right now, I don't know, you know, after January, I'll probably change my playlist a little bit, but for right now. <laughs> and um, what do you, what have you been watching? Any films, TV shows, or even document, documentaries? I'm into escapism, but anything that you recommend? Let's see, yeah, I, I just like, finished okay, it. Go, go ahead. Go I, ahead I'm go sorry, ahead. I, just, I just finished a terrific documentary, which was called, um, oh my goodness, what's the name of it? Um, the Good, Good Lord Bird, which was a, a biography of John Brown. And, wow. um, you know, the abolitionist movement of that time, uh, which was uh, done by Ethan Hawke, he, he played him and, and produced the thing. And it was really quite <laughs> oh, well yeah. done. I love and I think for people, for people who want to really understand the, the you know, the role that, uh, that John Brown and abolitionists played in, in the, the Civil War, in the beginning of the Civil War, it's really worth, it's really worth seeing. I think it's very well done. Mm -hmm. I'll watch it. Okay, Benoit. Well, I think, uh, uh, at Attenborough, I think is his name, the one he did one um, mm -hmm. about, about the, the world. And, and, and then also uh, The Octopus Teacher. I really liked a lot, that a lot. Mm. And, what uh, is okay. that? You're the second person who told me to re see that. Yeah, it's, it? a, it's about a, a diver and it's a really maybe about 40 episodes. And he um, befriends an octopus and every day goes down there and uh, they start connecting and relating and then at the end because uh, you know the octopus is always hiding from uh, uh, sharks and they have to blend into the environment but eventually uh, it gets eaten and he, at first he tries to protect it but then realizes this is the cycle of life having to really hang on to that things that are precious but to also realize that that we all have to let go that might make me sad. Well, I want to recommend, I've recommended this before, but I'm going to recommend it again. I mean, I haven't recommended it on this show yet. Lovecraft Country. I, oh, I heard Lovecraft about that. Country, it is amazing. It's about race, racism, history, science fiction, horror, fantasy. Uh, Jordan All Peele's in involved in it. I started to watch Hunter's but Hunters was, you know, the way that they depicted the concentration, it was a little too real for me. I just, you know, it was very hard for me to watch. But if you haven't watched it and you don't know what, what really happened in Nazi Germany, you need to watch it. And then you'll see some, you'll see some parallels with what happened in Nazi Germany. And it also shows the parallels with, um, like what Isabel Wilkerson talked about in Cast, it shows the parallel with I was just going to say, yeah. 
I was just going to call out Isabel Wilkerson's book, which I think may be one of the most important books in America right now. And I think everybody should read um, Isabel Wilkerson's book, Cast. Just brilliant. I agree. Well, I want to thank you both so much. This has been such a great show. Thank you for inspiring me. And now I'm going to take us out. I'm telling people this is Sima Lieberman, the inclusionist with Everyday Conversations on Race for Everyday People, which is a cross-race conversation on race. Um, thank you for joining me. If you want to reach me, you can hit me up on Twitter at The Inclusionist or Sima at SimaLieberman.com. If you want more of me, you can hit me up and you can invite me to speak at your next conference or event or facilitate a panel. And I can help you create more inclusion or have a conversation on race. And I'm always looking for great guests. So if you want to be a guest or you have an idea, let me know. And signing off, until next time, Sima Lieberman, The Inclusionist.